Good morning. Today I will be reading Acts chapter 10, 24 through 48. The following day he enters this area. Now Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him, fell at his feet, and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up and said, Stand up, I myself am also a man. While talking with him, he went in and found a large gathering of people. Peter said to them, You know it is forbidden for a Jewish man to associate with or visit a foreigner, but God has shown me that I must not call any person impure or unclean. That's why I came without any objection when I was sent for. So may I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius replied, Four days ago at this hour, at three in the afternoon, I was praying in my house. Just then, a man in dazzling clothing stood before me and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your acts of charity have been remembered in God's sight. Therefore, send someone to Joppa and invite Simon here, who is also named Peter. He is lodging in Simon the Tanner's house by the sea. So I immediately sent for you, and it was good of you to come. So now we are all in the presence of God to hear everything you have been commanded by the Lord. Peter began to speak. Now I truly understand that doc that God doesn't show favoritism, but in every nation, the person who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. He sent the message to the Israelites, proclaiming the good news of peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. You know the events that took place throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were under the tyranny of the devil, because God was with him. We ourselves are witnesses of everything he did in both the Judean country and in Jerusalem, and yet they killed him by hanging him on a tree. God raised up this man on the third day and caused him to be seen, not by all the people, but by us whom God appointed as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came down on all those who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and declaring the greatness of God. Then Peter responded, Can anyone withhold water and prevent these people from being baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? He commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay for a few days. Yes, amen. Yeah, so maybe this has been a distracting morning for you. Maybe it's been a busy morning for you. So we're here together in God's house with God's people. And so the most important thing we do is we pray. So maybe you haven't had an opportunity to pray or maybe just kind of slipped out from under you. So right now... We're going to pray, and during this time, this is your opportunity to pray right now. So I'm going to lead us, but don't just listen to me. You be praying. So Father, thank you for this opportunity to come together to worship and to study your word. I pray now that you would open my spiritual eyes and ears. God, that you would speak to me right at my point of need. That through the study of your word, that you would stir my affections for Jesus. So Holy Spirit, have your way in my heart. Speak to me. Convict me. And encourage me. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Uh, this morning, the title as we're going through Acts is The Conversion of a Religious Prejudice Jesus Follower. Now, here's what I want you to understand. All of us have struggles to one degree or another with pride. Now, now maybe you're not as prideful as you used to be, you know, but we all struggle with that to one degree or another. We all struggle with selfishness to one degree or another. And I would also argue that all of us struggle with prejudice to one degree or another. You may be saying, I'm not really prejudiced. I'm not saying, no, listen, this isn't just from one race to another, white to black. I mean, there's, there is, there's prejudice within the Anglo world. I mean, like, I, I was, you know, I mean, like, 
born and raised out here in East Texas, and I never will forget going in to go to Bible college and seeing and hearing. You know, I was you know, living in my bubble out here in East Texas. I didn't realize that the city people thought we were all backwoods, buck tooth, you know, <laughs> ignorant people out here. And to hear them talk about, to make fun of people that everybody who lived from Mesquite and East. And I thought Mesquite was the city people, you know. But see, you know as well as I do that just because you know, we eat maters and taters and we sleep on, sleep on a pillar doesn't mean that we don't know nothing, right? I was, you know, but, you know, we have prejudice between city people and country folks. And, you know, there's all kinds of prejudice. I never forget whenever, um, you know, I learned so many things when I worked on an oil rig. And, and one of the things that I learned is that, you know, there were some of these guys that were, I mean, like, they were not exactly what you would call articulate. But, man, whenever you get them out there, this, so that oil rig was a huge mechanical machine, and they were mechanical genius. I mean, like, the things that they could do, walk into a room with all these huge engines and stuff and never been in that room, and it could be messed up, and they walk in there and fix it like that. I mean, they were mechanical geniuses. Now, if you're playing, you know, if you're playing Trivial Pursuit, you would not want them on your team. But, I mean, man, when it comes to, to engines and stuff, they were a genius. You know, I mean, it's... it's for, for us, I mean, we look at this and we go, yeah, you know, I mean, I used to have these prejudices and, you know, God has delivered me from this and, and he's helped me with this. But listen, don't be offended this morning. Let me tell you the truth. And let me speak the truth to my own heart. We all, to one degree or another, struggle. The reason that our world is getting more and more divided is because... Of the, you could put these, you could put these right here, religion, prejudice. Man, we are becoming more and more divided all the time. I mean, every time we think we get one more thing behind us, you know, the, the, and there's like something else comes up now. Vaccinated, unvaccinated, I mean, political stuff, all the things that are divided. It, this isn't just a white and black thing, by the way. It isn't just race. There's all kinds of prejudice that we deal with. So I'm asking you this morning, instead of thinking about them, would you consider maybe asking the Holy Spirit to speak to you? Because you, you, you can't make somebody else unprejudiced, but the Holy Spirit can help you with yours if you're willing to do that this morning. So that's what I'm asking you to do as we study the Scripture, because we're looking at Peter. And if you were not here last week, Peter, a Jew of all Jews, and, and the Jews were prejudiced against all Gentiles. A Jewish man, one of the prayers that the Jew, a Jewish man would pray every morning, when well, he would thank God that I'm, not, that I'm not a Gentile and that I'm not a woman, and go on down through the prayer from there. Something like to say that, that, that the Jews did not like the Gentiles, this was a religious issue with them. They considered all Jews, considered all Gentiles to be unclean. And so now, you know, Peter's got this vision that he is to go with these men that are coming to his house. And these men who come to him house, to his house, they are Gentiles, but they're, they're leading him to Cornelius, who Cornelius is a, not only is he a Gentile, but he is a Roman soldier. Remember, Israel is under Roman oppression at this time. So, I mean, it's not that he just dislikes Gentiles, but Romans even more. And a Roman soldier, a centurion who holds not only, you know, this high rank, but also political power. I mean, that's the last place our boy Peter would choose to go of his own. But what happens is, is that Cornelius is praying. He's lost, by the way. He's not a Christian. He's not saved. He's praying, and Peter is praying. And God takes their prayers. If you remember last week, and he takes their prayers, whatever they're praying about, and he intercepts it according to Romans 8, 26, and diverts it to the will of God to where now God is going to bring these two praying men that would never know each other together. I could probably get a few of you up here to testify how God has done that in your life. Brought you together with people that in and of yourself you would never be hooked up with. And God has done miracles through that relationship with them. So let's get to our story this morning. Acts 10, 24 through 48. So this says, the men have come to Peter's house. Peter is left with them. Peter's taking some of his boys with him. He's got about six other 
Christians with him, and they're headed towards Cornelius' house. So it says the following day, Peter entered Caesarea. Now you have to understand also for Caesarea, and you know, we read that and we're like, okay, it don't really mean anything to me. So Caesarea is kind of the headquarters for the pagan Gentile world. Caesarea comes from Caesar. So I mean, like, so for a Jewish man to go to Caesarea, and that would be kind of like many of us going right to the center of Al-Qaeda right now or ISIS or something like that. You know, we wouldn't feel real comfortable going into that setting. We would not be welcomed in that setting. And here Peter with his other Jewish Christians, after saying they're all Jewish men also that are Christians, going into this setting, they, this, is not, this is not where they wanted to go. Now Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. It's kind of like he's got a vision from God. God said, you know, sin for this Jew. And, you know, and so he's like, all of his friends are like, what? And they're like, okay, we've got to come here. What's going to happen here? If not, nothing else, let's just come see what's going to happen here. Now, I don't see, we, we, we sanitize this and Sunday schoolize this up real good. Where we think these are all nice, happy, friendly, loving people that have no prejudice. You don't know what they were thinking when they got together. You got a bunch of Jews coming, or oh, come see this. God, you just heard of God, a vision? Okay, let's come see what's going to happen. They might have been expecting a royal rumble. Okay, so let's just unsanitize it. Let's just pull away all the stuff, the trappings we get from all of our Christian ease, and let's just, let's just see it for what it is. You got people that don't like each other coming together in the same room. Yes, it's ordained of God, and God is in this, but that doesn't necessarily mean they all come walking in with a Sunday school smile on their face. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him, fell at his feet, and worshipped him. <laughs> surprise, surprise, surprise. So, how do you think Peter would respond to this? Did Peter step back and go, hey, you're right, I'm the first pope, you need to be worshiping me. He said, but Peter lifted up, lifted him up and said, stand up, I myself am also a man. Now in, um, in Rome, there's, in St. Peter's Cathedral, there is a statue and about 800 years old and they left his, his foot protruding off the, the um, platform right there. And so Everybody who comes by for the last 800 years, they believe if they kiss and touch his foot that he will, and they ask Peter for a blessing, and this is what his foot looks like now after 800 years of people kissing and rubbing on that foot. So, so if that's okay, then Peter would have been like, yeah, you got it right, man. Look, check out, kiss, kiss my foot while you're down there, dude. He says, no, you get up. I'm a man just like you. Don't worship me. Listen, there's only one who can give blessings, and that's Jesus. There's only one man that's ever lived that can give blessings, and that's Jesus. No other man can do this. It's not okay here. Peter's not okay with this. While talking with him, he went in the first time he's ever entered a Gentile's house, and he found a large gathering of people. I don't know how you interpret that right there, okay? But... I don't know if you've ever been in a situation like this before. So, man, I got all kinds of stories running through my head, so I guess I'm going to tell you one. So when I went to Bible college years ago, I went into a class that was called Urban Ministry. And there was a, the, the, the professor was a black woman. I grew up in Grant Sleen. If you don't know what that means, what that means is, is that I had never known a black person in my whole life, Okay. And so we're walking in this class, and the first day of class, we're introducing ourselves, and she's asking us to tell, you know, where we're from and everything. And so, you know, I told her, I said, uh, my name's David Yarbrough, and I'm from Grant Saline. And she goes, whoa, what? And she goes, man, you are a full-grown country cracker, aren't you? <laughs> now, listen, in my bubble, I didn't know what cracker meant. <laughs> I was like, yeah, okay, I guess so. So she decided that she was going to educate me that semester. And she did. Let me tell you what she did. So she decided to take all of us to, you know, we're in downtown, the college, Criswell College, it's in downtown Dallas. She takes us out on the street to educate us. She gets out there and she grabs me. She, now listen, she never called me by my name. She called me Grant Sling. That's all she called me. She comes up, she grabs me by the arm and she goes, okay, Grant Sling, I got work for you. You go on with me. Come on. And we go walking down the street and she's talking 100 miles an hour. 
and, she, and she's talking, I'm listening to her and everything, and we come down to this alley, and we turn the corner in the alley, and when we turn the corner into the alley, I'm still engaging her, listening to her, talk to her, as we're walking down the alley, she's pulling me down, and then when I look up, all of a sudden, I see what looks like 10,000 black men, and they see me with her. And they all turn around. And listen, this is not me trying to make the story more impactful. This is the way I remember it. They all saw me and her and turned around. And all, I mean, they were all talking and talking and just were carrying on. And they turned around and saw it just stopped. And every single one of them was looking at me. And my heart, I kid you not, my heart just sunk. And she just kept on pulling. She said, come on. And we go walking right. And they're, like, they're just kind of parting as she's pulling through. And she pulls through. And in the middle... What's happening here is there is a man that has got a big table out here, and he's feeding these homeless people. And she comes walking up, and the first time she used my name, she comes up to him, and she says, Hey, so-and-so, this is Pastor David Yarbrough. And the guy shook out his hand and goes, Hey, Pastor. And I kid you not, as soon as his hand hit my hand, everything goes back to normal. And everybody starts talking to me, and we're all okay and everything. So... I don't know if you've ever walked into a situation that was outside your comfort zone like that, to where you, you didn't know if everything's going to work out okay. But see, when I, when I read this story and I read about Peter going into this Gentile place where he found a large gathering right there, I don't see him walking in all swelled up and like, well, I'm fixing to straighten all y'all out. This may have been a whole different story. He may have been walking in thinking, I don't know how this is going to work out. Peter said to them, <laughs> it's our boy Peter you know it's forbidden for me to be associated now listen this is associate kalo right here that Greek word we don't have a good English equivalent for that it's not associate it's like bind and bring together he said listen you know that it's forbidden for a Jewish why is it forbidden is that from the Bible mm -mm. the Bible never called the Gentiles unclean the Bible never said that the Jews were not to associate with the Gentiles. They had taken this from their, their extra biblical writings and they had taught this to themselves, the Jewish people right here, that, that they were not to associate or do, that it's unlawful, not according to the Bible, but according to what they said. So he said that, you know, it's forbidden for a Jewish man to associate, to bind, to come together with or visit a foreigner, or visit, so he says, even visit a foreigner. But God has shown me that I must not call any of y'all filthy pigs anymore. <laughs> well, he's starting off on the right foot, isn't he? <laughs> Listen, I mean, he's, I mean, he's, going, he's not winning friends or anything right here. I mean, it's just kind of, he just lays it all out there. So right here, they all should have got offended. Listen, if they were living in 2021, they would have all been offended already. That's why I came without any objection when I was sent for. So may I ask why you sent for me? And that's amazing to me because he's just spent four days with the guys who came and got him. So I mean, like along the way, evidently along the way, they weren't talking very much. Okay? No, no. I'm just, this is me just speculating on this because I think that if they were communicating, that Peter would have asked, why are y'all sending for me? Evidently on this four-day journey, they didn't really talk very much, at least not about why they're coming in. Cornelius replied, four days ago at this hour, at three in the afternoon, I was praying in my house. Just then, a man in dazzling clothing stood before me. If you know, last week he didn't say that. He's, he's elaborating a little more on what he was seeing. He didn't talk about the, the dazzling clothes in the text previous to this. So he's kind of expanding on it a little bit more. And said, Cornelius... Your prayer, remember Cornelius is lost, he needs the gospel. Your prayer has been heard. See, that's going to mess up some people's theology because I remember growing up in church, people saying, God don't hear a lost man's prayer. <laughs> what? I don't, I don't know where that came from. Who came up with that? That is not what the Bible says. God hears every prayer, any prayer he wants to hear. I mean, it's like God's all-knowing, right? You got that. If he's all-knowing, that doesn't mean he's like, I don't hear any prayers now. If you want to get into the theological aspect of that, does he answer all prayers? Okay. So he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard. And your acts of charity, the good things that you've done, listen, don't, you know, we're not saved by works. We're not works righteousness. 
all that's against the Bible. But here's what you have to understand. His good works, his charity, they've been remembered. I mean, he did it with the right heart and the right motives, evidently, and it was honoring to God. And God's like, I see this. I see what you're doing. I see the attempts that you make. Now, see, my argument would be that Cornelius couldn't even do this unless the Holy Spirit was stirring and drawing him and wooing him in towards God. So it's been remembered in God's sight. So Cornelius is what we would say, we would call Cornelius a good man. We look at him and say, man, this is a good man. He's praying and he's doing these good things. He's a good man, but he's a lost man. He's, he needs the gospel, and that's why Peter is coming to him. That's why God told him in the vision, go get Peter. Come, because Peter, he knows Peter's going to do one thing. Peter is going to preach the gospel. So, Ephesians 2, 1 through 2. Now listen, if you don't know, the, write this down if you're taking notes and you want to study what the gospel is all about. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. I mean, that is the, that, that's like, I mean, I don't know if I'd say that's the prologue of the gospel or that's the, the foundation of the gospel. I don't know what word to put in there, but I mean, that really helps us wrap our minds around the implication of the gospel. Because Ephesians 2, 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This, and matter of fact, that can be translated these, toto in, in Greek, these are not from yourselves. The faith and the grace, but are God's gift is a literal translation there. So that's, that's our foundation to understand conversion. We talk about the conversion of a religious prejudice Jesus follower. And that's Peter, by the way. I'll, I'll flesh that out in just a moment. Because, now, Peter's not converted from lost to saved. Okay? He's already saved. But there's a conversion that needs to take place in his heart about understanding that it's not only salvation for Jews. God's going to convert that understanding that it's also, a con that, that Gentiles also can be saved. Thank God, because probably most, if not all of us in here, are Gentiles. So you're a dead. This is what it says right here. Ephesians 2, 1. And you were. So it's talking about before conversion, and you were dead in your trespass. What can a dead man do? Nothing. In your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler and the power of the air, which is that is the devil, the spirit now working in the disobedience. So I think about this, I think about another good man in the Bible. His name was Nicodemus. John 3:16. Okay? Let's go previous to John 3:16. John 3:1. There was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to him, speaking of Jesus, at night, under cover of darkness. Doesn't want anybody else to see and to know that he is coming to talk to Jesus. And he said, Rabbi, we, that's interesting, he says, we, not just me. <laughs> so this is just what I'm thinking. Evidently, he's been talking to the other religious readers. He says, we all agree on this. We know that you are a teacher who has come from God. Why? Because no one could perform these signs that you do unless God were with him. And it's as if Jesus cuts him off right here and gets right down to the foundation of the problem. Here's what Jesus' reply is. Jesus replied, truly I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. There's the foundation. You must be born again. You must be born spiritually. Oh, you can't see the kingdom of God. Didn't anything to do with you having good works, you being a good man, you being religious? None of that. There has to be the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit in and through your life. How do you know you're saved? See, here's our problem. As we have measurables in our, and, and all, we always do, it's just by human nature, we got measurables. How do I know I'm saved? Well, if I do this or if I stop doing this, then there's this place right here, and I know that if I'm above, this is how I know I'm saved because I don't do these things down here. That doesn't matter. You got to be born again. Say, so, okay, so how do I know if I'm born again? Good question. Let me answer it this way. How do you know if you're born spiritually? The same way you know if you were born physically. How do you? How can you prove you were born physically? Because you're alive. You have to go get a certificate or something like that or go get some people that were there. And I can say, well, I was born. I mean, like, you're here and you're alive. Then I'm like, okay, I know you were born physically. So how do I know that I was born spiritually? Because I'm alive spiritually. 
He just, let me tell you something. See, because some, no doubt, of you have or you are or you will struggle at some time with feeling like God is distant. Let me tell you something. If you ever felt that way or you're feeling that way right now, got good news for you. You can't even realize God is distant unless the Holy Spirit is working in you. If a dead man don't, doesn't realize if God's close or God's far. So, I mean, if you're like, you're like man, I'm, like, right now I feel like God is distant. That's, that's the Holy Spirit working in you. You should thank God for that. You can't do that apart, in and of yourself. You can't manufacture that. So how do you know you're, you've been born again? How do you know that you are saved or whatever, you, you're in Christ, whatever you want to put in that right there? You know because you're spiritually alive today. I don't, that's, if I'm, the conversion, what's, what's being converted right here? What's being, my, everything's being converted. My want to's. And the reason I go to church is so I want to check off a list and say, God, look, I'm here. God, check, look, I'm here. So bless this week. Man, keep that coronavirus away from me. It, it does, that's, no, I'm here because there's something pulling me towards God. There's something, the Holy Spirit inside of me, a desire to know God, to be close to God, to be, I mean, if we're to, to come together with God's people in God's house and to worship him. Not because this church is perfect or other Christians are perfect or good or not mean, whatever it may be, because none of that's true. It isn't because of the church, because I'm drawn to Jesus. See, conversion is not a call to religion and morality. See, that, this, is, this is what this is religion. This is our problem with religion right here. Is we think it's we think it's about morality and being better, but I would argue that it's a challenge to religion and morality. Because in, in more religion, I'm like, I've worked good enough. I'm a good person, so i got to be going to heaven. See, true conversion challenges that. It's not about you being good. The only one. Think about this. When the rich young ruler came to Jesus, and he addressed him, and he said, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus didn't turn to him and say, Well, listen, you say a prayer, you sign a card, you join the church, you get baptized. Didn't say that. He turned to him, listen, here's what he said. Why do you call me good? There's only one good, and that is God alone. So he addresses his first error right there in thinking that it's about being good because the richer and ruler, as far as everybody had told him, he was in. But there's something messing with his heart that he's going to ask Jesus. Do you want Jesus to validate that? I don't know, but here's what I know. Jesus cuts right, just like he does with Nicodemus, he must be born again. He cuts right to the issue with him. This isn't about good and bad. So it's a challenge to that true conversion, transformation from the inside out. So back to Cornelius answering Peter, therefore, Send someone to Joppa. This is what the vision said to him. And invite Simon here, who is also named Peter. He is lodging in Simon the Tanner's house by the sea. So immediately I sent for you. And it was good for you to come. So now we are all in the presence. Wait a second. I thought he's in Cornelius' house. How's he in the presence of God? Because you do realize something that this building right here is not the church, right? The, the, the church is like right here. It's the assembly of God's people. When we assemble together, that is the church. It is not the building. We are all in God's presence to hear everything you have been commanded. You know what, listen, here's our problem. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about myself too. Is that many of us have heard hundreds and hundreds of sermons, if not thousands and thousands of sermons so we come in, so right now, some of y'all sitting here right now, and you're like, oh, man, who moved up there? What was that? <laughs> Did you see them up there? What's that? I mean, what's, I, what's a mess? A little bit chilly in here right now. <laughs> kind of hungry. I heard this a million times. Man, I think, I mean, this is same old thing. They had never heard a Christian sermon. Now, I tell you, there's all kinds of stories. I don't know what's going on in my mind, and I'm just like... There's all kinds of stuff. I'm going to tell you another one real quick. I'm going to give you the short version, okay? 
So I was privileged to go on a short-term mission trip to China, and in China, you know, you can't preach the gospel openly. I ended up in a college, and the, the whole college came together for an assembly, and it just so happened that what we would call the dean of the college, he was, an, he was a Christian, and he knew the missionary that was undercover that we were with. We were in there, so here's what happened. The whole college come together, and it just worked out to where they gave us to go ahead to preach the gospel to the whole college. They turned to me, and they said, David, this is your specialty. So I stood up in front of them, greatest privilege. I can't tell the story without just, it just churning inside of me. Here's what I want to tell you. All those that, so most of them, they had heard of Jesus as a historical figure, but they had never heard the gospel. They never heard the virgin birth. They never had the death, 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 burial, and resurrection, that he's 100% God, 100% man. So as I preach that, as I proclaim that gospel, that euangelion, that good news to them, do you know what those college students did? 17, 18, 19, 20 years old? They didn't move. They got up on the edge of their seat, and they hung on every word I said. They had never heard it before. So then I come back here, and I'm coming back to preach to y'all. And, oh, man, I'm sure I'm hungry. What are we having for lunch today? So here's what I want to tell you right here. They, listen, they were, listen, they came to hear everything that you have been commanded by the Lord. They could not wait to hear this message. Peter began to speak. Now I truly understand that God does not, it's like, this isn't in theory, now in practice. I understand that God doesn't show favoritism because he had been taught his whole life that God favors the Jewish people. They are his chosen people, all that, which is true. And so now he thinks, okay, we're favored above everybody else. But he's realizing here that we're all one race, and that's human. We all came from Adam. But in every nation, the person who fears him, and I would argue you can't fear him without the Holy Spirit moving in you, and does what is right. You can't do that without the Holy Spirit doing that is acceptable to him. So he sent the message to the Israelites, proclaiming the good news of peace through him. And this is so interesting right here because you guys listen to me preach every week. You know, we talk about the euangelion, the good news, the gospel. So here it is. This is, I want to give you the little translation for this right here in Greek. This is what it says. This isn't euangelion. This is euangeli zominas. So that means gospel lies. That he sent the message to gospelize peace through Jesus Christo, Jesus Christ, to gospelize peace. Why would it say that? Peter's wrapping up this. He's giving the gospel. Why would he say gospelize peace through Jesus Christ? Because there's only one way you can have peace with God, and that's to have your sins forgiven. The death, burial, and resurrection is how we have our sins forgiven. We have peace with God and then peace with ourselves and peace with other people. That's the only way. So proclaiming the peace, the, the euangelion, it's this, that he is Lord of all. Now, I know you're sitting in church right now, and I say, do you believe Jesus is Lord of all? That most of y'all say, yes, I believe he's Lord of all. Let me ask you something. When you say he is Lord of all, do you mean that he is Lord of the coronavirus? Do you mean that he is Lord of every pestilence? That he is Lord of everything. There's nothing that ever gets out of his control. That ISIS never gets out of his control. That the worst things in this world never get out of his control. Nothing ever slips out and he's like, whoops, I don't know what to do about that. I mean, that just got out of control on me. So if I'm saying he's Lord of all, then I mean that he is, that there isn't anything that happens in this world that he can't stop, he can't shut down, he can't bring to an end. He can bring it all to an end if he wants to. That, listen, the only way anything survives is by his approval. That's hard for me to grasp. That's hard for me to wrap my mind around. But here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, Jesus came near and he said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and... Boy, that brings me comfort today. Because things have not been going very well the past few weeks. Things have not been, we've been getting, we've been praying for things and they didn't happen the way we, we prayed for them to happen. So I have to land on the fact that God is good, God is sovereign, he's in control, he knows what's best. He didn't give us what we want, but he gives us what we need. You know the events that took place, Peter's still preaching here, throughout all Judea beginning 
from Galilee after the baptism that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit with power. What? That blows my mind. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Jesus, 100% God and 100% man. Why would he need to be anointed with the Holy Spirit? That blows my mind. I mean, don't you want to give the answer to that? I don't know. But here's what I do know. That if Jesus didn't get an exemption from prayer, if he prayed, I need to be praying. If Jesus needed to be filled and anointed with the Holy Spirit, then I, more so, need to be filled and anointed with the Holy Spirit as well. And how he went about doing good, and this right here, another thing, this, this one, we could spend all day on this. He went about doing good, healing all who were under the tyranny of the devil because God was with him under healing the tyranny of the devil. Now, come back to that God is sovereign thing once again. But for some reason, man, hell is being unleashed on this world right now. I mean, hospitals are filled up. Man, this thing is all over the world. This isn't just something that's right here with us. It's all over the world. And listen, so some of you have listened to me preach for four years. This is my four-year anniversary, by the way, today. So no, don't clap. It's okay. It's okay. I don't have to clap. That's all right. It's all right. But, but I want you to ask you a question. You guys that hear me preach every week, how many times have I come in here and tried to tell you this is the end of the world? Never? I never have. Never have. I want to tell you something. Things keep on going like they're going. I may be changing my tune. This is, I mean, like, I've never seen in my time anything like what we're going through right now. So, I mean, all the people that are saying that, I'm like, mm, they might be right. We ourselves are witnesses of everything he did. Peter's not like, let me tell you what all we did. I actually walked on water <laughs> for a little bit. He didn't say that. He said, we were witnesses of everything that he did. It's not what we did. We were just witnesses. We saw what he did. And that's today also your call to be a witness, by the way. You know, you're witnessing. You're a witness of what God is doing, he has done. So it's not about what you do and all that. To see. You can't save anybody, by the way. God's the one that does the saving. You're just a witness in telling other people. So we ourselves witness of everything he did, both in Jude the Judean country and in Jerusalem, and yet they killed him. And see, they, speaking of the Jews, killed him by hanging him on a tree because they're the ones that had the Romans to do that. Oh, but look at this. Get to this. Here's the good news right here. Today, church, I need some good news. Does anybody else need some good news today? Here is the good news. Jesus did not stay in the grave. God raised this man up on the third day and calls him to be seen. So it's not like this just happened and nobody saw it. Paul said 500 people at one time saw him after the resurrection before the ascension. Not by all the people, but by us whom God appointed as witnesses and we ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. I mean, like, so this wasn't just us, like, thinking we're seeing a vision here. I mean, he ate and drank. The physical, I mean, that, I mean, this was something physical they were seeing here. And then this physical body ascended, and mm, that's too much for me. Ascended into heaven right there in front of them. I mean, that blows my ever-loving mind. He commanded us, and that's a strong word in Greek also, that command, it's a military term that you have to do. It's an authoritative military term. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the horizon. Let me give you the, okay, this is weak. He is the horizon appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. Why is that important, horizon right there? It's horizon. That's how we should translate that. But see, when most of us will read that, we're like, What? What, what happens at a horizon? That's where everything breaks. That's where the earth starts here and the sky starts there. That's the breaking. That's the divide. The horizon, go look it up. It's the dividing point. So he is the dividing point appointed by God to be the judge of the living. Now, 
How do I understand the living? The only person that's living is a person who's in Christ. Will I be judged on the judgment seat of Christ? Yes, my sins will not be judged, but my works will be judged at the, the, the judgment seat of Christ, the beam of seat of Christ. And there's also going to be the white throne judgment of God for all those who are not in Christ Jesus. They will be judged as well. He is, a, listen, he's either going to be our Savior or he's going to be our judge. That's the dividing point right there, lost and saved. Not good and bad. Not religious and not religious. I mean, it's, it's either lost or saved. In Christ or not in Christ. He is the dividing point, the horizon. All the prophets testify about him that through his name, his authority rule, everyone who believes you're saved by grace through faith in him receives forgiveness of sins. Have your sins been forgiven? Our problem, me too, is we don't think about this very much. We don't think about the reality of what that means to have all of our sins forgiven, that they are forgiven. Whatever you think the little sins and the big sins are, however you categorize that, doesn't matter. That thing that's still today that you regret, those huge regrets, they've been forgiven. They come under the blood of Christ. They are totally wiped away. They've been removed as far as the east is from the west, what the Bible says, that they're gone. See, if we were Pentecostal right now, we would jump up and run around the room and hit up, jump, jump on the chair and just scream and holler and rejoice on that. While Peter was still speaking these words, <laughs> he didn't get to land the plane. He didn't get to finish the sermon. He didn't get to give the invitation. Oh, ouch. <laughs> the Holy Spirit came down on all those who heard the message because he gave the gospel. Death, burial, and resurrection, forgiveness of sins. Holy Spirit's like, all right, we come coming right in. <laughs> hey, do you all wish that the Holy Spirit would interrupt my sermon and just come in and just wipe us all out? Some of y'all are like, no. <laughs> the circumcised believers, Jewish believers, because to this point they think if you're going to be a Christian, you first got to convert to Judaism. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter they were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on even the dogs, the pigs, the Gentiles, the unclean, they're astonished to see this. For they heard them speaking in tongues and declaring the greatness of God. Now, where had they seen this before? Acts chapter 2. When the Holy Spirit got poured out on them and they started speaking in tongues, people were hearing each, they were hearing one another in their own language. And so now you got, and now, now you, listen. Another error or two is I've heard people say that everybody who gets saved in the book of Acts speaks in tongues. Paul's conversion, he didn't speak in tongues. The Ethiopian eunuch, he didn't speak in tongues. Not everybody does, but we've got two groups here. We've got the first group there at Pentecost, and now we've got the first the next group here. All Gentiles, they did not convert to Judaism. The first people who they see there as a group that, that are not converting to Judaism, that become Christians, and now they are speaking in tongues just like they did. So, so I mean, when Paul saw this, I mean, when Peter saw this, and the other believers, they're like, this reminds me of the same things happening to them almost that happened to us at Pentecost. Listen, and here is a true sign of conversion right here. Declaring the greatness of God, that's worship, that there is none other like him. Listen, you, listen. I'll tell you something. Those of you who love to worship the Lord, I mean, like, there's just an, an, an impulse in you to worship as much as you possibly can. I got good news for you. That is proof positive that the Holy Spirit is working in your life. Our flesh does not like to worship our flesh does not like to read the Bible. Our flesh doesn't even like to go to church. Oh, man, there goes our rabbits all over the place. We've got to let them all get away right now. Just get on out of here. 
So here's a conversion of a religious, prejudiced Jesus follower that what I hear that what he's saying, man, we see in this speaking in tongues, they're declaring they're worshiping God. Then Peter responded, can anyone withhold water and prevent these people from being baptized? He just got converted. He's realizing now that everybody can be saved. Who have received the Holy Spirit just as we, just like we did at Pentecost is what he's saying right there. He commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they said, this has been a great home group, but let's turn this into a disciple now meeting. (laughs) Just stay here. Y'all stay here. Because although we are in Christ now, although we have received the Holy Spirit, we need further instruction. We would call that discipleship. We need you to tell us more, help us to understand what this means to be in Christ Jesus. What does this mean to be saved? What does this mean to be a Christian? How do I walk this out? Look at this. Look who wrote this. The guy on that day. Now listen, you come back next week, Peter doesn't do so good next week. You think, man, that Peter's seen all these great things. He's been converted. I mean, like, it's just, and Peter's going to slip right back into his religious, prejudiced self. Oh, listen, you see, next week you come back, I'll tell you something. If you ever struggled or backslid, you will be encouraged next week by the text. Peter does that thing that many of us, then we're like, man, I must not be a Christian. But when it's all said and done, when he wraps it all up, when he finally gets a grasp on the gospel, when he truly gets to the place where God wants him to be, here he is, Second Peter, and this is what he says. Look at this. Make every effort to supplement your faith so you're saved by grace through faith. And you hear me say this all the time. You're not saved by works. But listen, I want to tell you something. I would never preach against morality. I would never tell you, oh, listen, just go do what you want to do. You're saved. It doesn't really matter. That's against the Bible, by the way, if I did that. I mean, if we did that, you need to go talk to the elder and say, listen, you know, I go sit down and talk to David. <laughs> so, I mean, the Bible makes it very clear that, yes, I'm saved, but then I have a responsibility to work out my salvation with fear and trembling. Now, I've got to engage in this faith that God has given. I've got to engage in Jesus. I've got to engage in the church, other Christians. I've got to engage in worship. That's my responsibility. So I've got to supplement your faith with goodness, goodness with knowledge, how much, how much time did you spend gaining knowledge of the Word of God this past week? Knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance. Hupomeno is the Greek word there, to hyperstand. With godliness. Godliness with brotherly affection. How much time have you spent this week praying that God would stir your affections for Him, stir your affections for the church? When I say the church, I mean the people in the church. Godliness, brother affection, brotherly affection with love. For if you possess these qualities in, look at this. He bookends it. I mean, he comes right back to the increasing measure. He said, verse 5, with increasing measure. That's my responsibility. I've got to be praying. I've got to be, I've got to be studying God's word. I've got to be worshiping. I've got to be fellowshipping with other believers. I've got to be doing these things in increasing measure. I've got to work out my salvation with fear and trembling. They will keep you from being useless and unfruitful. Anybody else in here other than me ever had a time in your Christian life where you were fruitless and unuseless? Un- 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 no. Some of y'all are like, I'm never raising my hand. <laughs> I care what he says. <laughs> they will keep you from being useless and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The person who lacks these things is blind. And short-sighted and has forgotten the cleansing from his past sins. You see this? I mean, like, I've got to keep that at the forefront of my mind. And I listen, I have been forgiven of all of my sins. <laughs> They're wiped away. They're under the blood. I've been, I'm under the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. His righteousness has been imputed to me. Listen, if y'all won't get excited, I will. I'll do it for you. I'll get excited for all of you in here. Therefore, brothers and sisters, he says it again, make every effort to confirm your calling and election because you've been called and elected if you're in Christ. 
the Holy Spirit did this great work in you because if you do these things, you will never stumble. How many of y'all enjoy stumbling spiritually? That is a painful thing to stumble spiritually, to fall spiritually. And what Peterson, consider who wrote this, the one who we see fall over and over again, and we'll see him fall again next week. This is what he says, getting down to the end of his life, and he's writing, and he says, hey, listen, make every effort. Listen, I want to ask you a question. Are you making every effort to supplement your faith? I'm not trying to mess with your emotions. I'm just trying to tell you the truth right now. There's a whole lot of people in the hospital that would love to trade spots with you right now. There's a whole lot of people that wish they could go back. You younger Anybody that's under 100 years old, <laughs> there's a whole lot of people that wish they could go back, get a do-over. And they would make every effort because they realize the most important things in life are not sports, they're not my job, they're not my career, they're not my money, they're not my looks. The most important things in life, the things that will matter two minutes after you die is your relationship with Jesus and how you grew in your faith and how you joined God in what he's doing in this world. That's what will matter two minutes after you die. All this other prejudice and hate and division let me tell you something. People look at that and they're like, man, there's atheists that look at that and say, how can you believe there's a God with all this stuff? Let me tell you something. Here's how I believe. I believe that Jesus is in heaven right now storing up his wrath to pour out on all this. Whenever he pours out his wrath on all this, he's going to make every wrong right. Everything that's been wrong that you have suffered through in this world, he is going to make it right, and he is going to pour out his judgment on those who have rejected him and those who have worked for the evil one we saw a while ago. He is storing up, the Bible says he's storing up his wrath to pour out on them right now. So do I believe Jesus is good, that he's alive? Yes, absolutely. And I do believe also that, hey, yes, he's loving, we love that, but I'll tell you something else. God is a God of love, and God is a God of wrath. That's how I believe. Yeah, God exists, and he's long-suffering. Man, is he long-suffering. Thank God he's long-suffering. I've needed that mercy and that grace. Still need it. Let's all stand. Okay, so I don't know why I'm supposed to tell you all this story. I have fought it from the very beginning, and you would think after 20 years of doing this, I would know better than to do this. This doesn't make any sense in my mind, but I'm going to tell you the story anyway. Matter of fact, it's embarrassing. I'd rather not do it, but I'm going to do it anyway. So, as I told you all a while ago, I grew up in Grant Slane. Um, if y'all don't know what that means, so as an adult, I went to Bible college. So I go into Bible college, and when I go into Bible college, um, there's all different races in there, and like I said, I'd never been... I never had had a friend that was a black person before, is what I would say. I, I knew them, talked to black people, stuff like that a little bit, but never had a friend. And so going to school, I pray, say, God, you know, who do you want me to be a friend with? So I do what we do when I walk into the classroom on the first day. I look where the white, middle-aged men are, and I go sit with them. And so we take a break, and I'm coming back into the class, and there is... A black man. Listen, if it hurts your feelings that I say black, then listen, get over that, okay? It's, I don't mean anything bad by that. So, I come up, and, and as I'm walking in, he looks up at me. <laughs> he goes, I didn't know him. But here's what, I'm drawn to respect. 
Anybody that shows any kind of respect, I'm drawn to that. And I, and I go over there and I sit down with the other rude, middle-aged Anglo men that know it all and all that. I could go on about that. <laughs> and class is over with, I walk over there and, and I introduce myself. His name was Give More. What a great name, Give More. So I sit down there and start talking to him. And tell him that, you know, before we start getting to know each other, I tell him I'm passionate and all this kind of stuff. And he says, um, can I pray for you? I said, sure. I kid you not, he had never met me before. <laughs> he prayed and prayed about every struggle that I was going through. Like he knew, like I had told him, just open my heart. Like I was, I was sitting there listening to him pray, and I was like, how does he even know that? And so when he got through praying, he called me pastor. I want to tell you something. He never called me anything other than pastor. I was not his pastor, but that's how he talked. That's what he said to me. So my next time in class, do you know where I went to go sit? And we had, we spent the whole day together. We had the rest of our classes together and lunch and chapel and all that the rest of that semester. He became a friend. So 